Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to this week's Development Studies Seminar Series and thank you in advance uh, again for your patience. Um, so we're delighted to have joining us tonight uh, Dr. Tariq Jazil, uh, who's a reader in human geography at UCL, prior to which he worked at Royal Holloway University, the Open University and the University of Sheffield. His research interests lie in the crossroads between critical geography, post-colonial theory, and South Asian studies, and his work focus on, focuses on aesthetic and cultural constitutions of space and the political, as well as the post-colonial politics of geographical knowledge production. He's editor of the journal Antipode on the editorial collective of social text and co-founded and co-directs UCL's Center for the Study of South Asia and the Indian Ocean World. He's co-authored or authored over 30 journal articles, uh, the most recent of which include the paper that he's presenting this evening, as well as urban theory with an outside and mainstreaming geography's decolonial imperative. Also joining us, we're delighted to have Raul Rao, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Politics and International Studies here at SOAS. Uh, prior to this, he was a fellow and Rhodes Scholar at the University of Oxford. His research interests lie in international relations theory, the international relations of South Asia, comparative political thought, and gender and sexuality. He's currently working on a book on queer post-colonial temporality and his first book, Third World Protest Between Home and the World, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2010, explored the relationship between cosmopolitanism and nationalism in a post-colonial uh, protest movement. Um, if you wish to tweet this evening during the seminar, we encourage you to do so, and the hashtags are SOASDevStudies and ESRC. Uh, so with that preamble out of the way, I'll hand over to Tariq, who will uh, begin by introducing his talk. Um, thanks very much. Um, is that, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's great to get a round of applause before doing anything. That's <laughs> fantastic. Um, um, thank you so much for the invitation um, to come and present here. It's real thrill for me to be here, so thank you Faisy, thank you Raul in advance, and thank you Joe. Um, so, I want to start, yeah, I want to start with a brief moment from the Sudanese author Tayeb Saleh's 1969 novel, Season of Migration to the North. <coughs> Excuse me, and I confess that this, this reading isn't my own. I'm leaning quite heavily here on Amir Mufti's rather brilliant 2005 article on what he refers to as global comparativism. Now, um, for those who haven't read it, Season of Migration to the North is a kind of inversion of Conrad's Heart of Darkness. The novel's Kurtz figure is Mustafa Saeed, a Sudanese man who finds himself in London in the 1950s and sets about seducing, then driving to suicide, a series of English women who harbour Orientalist fantasies about him. So narratively speaking, Said's actions are the colonial counterpoint to Kurtz's decline into madness in Heart of Darkness and his obsession to, to exterminate all the brutes. In Season of Migration to the North, after a prison term in England, our Sudanese protagonist, Said, returns to Sudan and settles in a village on the banks of the River Nile, where he meets and tells a story, sorry, tells his story to the novel's narrator, who himself has just returned from England with a PhD in English poetry. And it's a moment towards the end of the novel that Amir Mufti focuses on in his reading that I want to draw out here. It's a moment when the narrator enters a room in Saeed's house that's always been kept, kept locked, a room that's always been kept locked. And in an image as cultural as I think it is political economic, it turns out that the room is a replica of an English study with Victorian chairs covered in silk, a round table with notebooks on it, a fireplace, oil portraits on the wall, and photographs of Saeed arranged on a shelf. But most of all, books. Books which line the walls everywhere books that sit on chairs, books on tables, books on the floor, an A to Z of books, covering topics from astronomy through zoology, 
philosophers from Moore through Wittgenstein, four volumes by Mustafa Said himself, even the Koran and Bible in English. I'm not going to read through this extensive quote, but the point I want to make is there wasn't a single Arabic, Arabic book in that library. So for the narrator, the room is at once a prison, a huge joke, a treasure chamber. <clears throat> now, my paper this evening set against um, this backdrop, against the backdrop of Mustafa Said's anglophonic and allegorical library. And it's a paper that attempts to push at that kind of jocular ambiguity that makes it difficult, I think, for us to decide whether this is a library that's bountiful with the promise of intellectual treasure or, in fact, a prison. And in doing so, I, I want to respond quite directly to the challenge of decolonizing knowledge, specifically coming from my own discipline, decolonizing geographical knowledge, I guess, uh, and specifically by thinking about what that task of opening geography to the world might entail, or opening social science to the world might entail. And I want to do this by suggesting that as a discipline, a methodological disposition towards singularity might well facilitate the decolonization of geographical knowledge and, and, and its production. So instead of trusting that we can build an adequate critical imagination for our reading publics, for our students, uh, and for ourselves with the resources that Said's library offers us, I want to argue that the particular, the singular, offers us compelling ways of moving our critical imaginations towards alterity. I want to propose the singular as an ethical imperative, if you like, poised to mitigate the possibility of research on southern, subaltern or indigenous contexts becoming a kind of, kind of empirical conscript to a theoretical modernity that remains firmly located in the Euro-American Academy. So the singular, in this sense, I think offers us a direction of travel that can puncture the conceit of Said's library. And it's bountiful but intensely Eurocentric promise of utopian worldliness in the light of the fact that, as Amir Mufti extrapolates from his reading of Mustafa Said's library, we're all Eurocentric now. I've used the word manifesto to describe the task of making this argument, and I'm aware that it's a, it's a rather bombastic and imperfect trope, really, for what I want to do, principally because it's central to my argument today that there, there is no, and there can be no, formulaic access to the singular. Instead, by, by using the word manifesto, I think what I mean to do is mark out a few methodological resources and watchwords germane to that task of decolonizing geographical knowledge via an orientation, its orientation toward the singular. <clears throat> but let me stress that the idea of a manifesto for incomparable geographies intentionally gestures to, to, to the work in um, urban studies that's emerged in recent years, um, particularly around comparativism, comparative urbanism. Urban geographers, urban uh, people working in urban studies have over the last 10, 15 years or so been acutely aware of the values and the pitfalls of comparative methods for urban research. So the field has seen a proliferation of work that first critically points to the implicit comparisons when global south cities are framed by an archive of urban theory that's largely emerged from research conducted on a few key cities that become paradigmatic or superlative. So Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, London, Paris, for example, these are the examples of the cities um, from which urban theory tends to be generated. And, and comparative urbanists recently have been drawing attention to that kind of um, Eurocentrism, or Euro-Americanism, I should say, of urban studies knowledge production, historically speaking. And second, urban studies has steadily, since, since this kind of um, critique, it's steadily built a new repertoire of urban knowledge by comparing diverse cities across and between global north and south, rejecting the integrationist modes of comparison that consciously or unconsciously pull all cities into urban studies' unfortunate history of categorization and developmentalism. 
And my subtitle should make it clear that singularity speaks in relation to that work. In other words, even though this isn't an urban paper per se, it's in the context of urban studies turned towards comparison and comparativism that it makes sense, I think, to emphasise singularity as an ethical imperative for decolonising geographical knowledge production. Um, sorry, I think I'm slightly behind myself on my slides here, but never mind. Um, but let me be clear that, that a manifesto for incomparable geographies isn't a manifesto against comparison. Indeed, some of the work on urban comparison, um, some of the best work in urban, urban comparison, I think, is aimed precisely to bring us face to face with the incomparable. So Colin McFarlane, for example, has been quite clear that his own interrogation of comparison in urban studies moves towards, uh, quoting him, one possible route through which alternative theories of the urban might emerge. And likewise, my colleague over in the geography department at UCL, Jenny Robinson, has been consistent and insistent that comparative urbanism at its most useful should lead urban studies toward conceptual revision and experimentation. And some of Jenny's most recent work, I think, has mobilised Deleuzean notions of singularity precisely as a way of interrogating how urban case studies might productively generate a revisable and ultimately more global urban studies. But I remain deeply surprised that these debates and these questions haven't had a wider impact in my discipline more generally, in geography, that is, beyond its urban domains. Because part of what I'm arguing today is that I think we should cultivate a certain kind of ambivalence, a disciplinary ambivalence to our extant ideas. And in fact, an openness towards singularity, I think, demands this kind of ambivalence. To this extent, then, I think we might push the implica implications of urban comparativism much further, actually, particularly in terms of that very notion of revisability. Because it seems to me that, that heuristically, at least, we might interrogate the way that those commitments to revisable urban theory in the service of a more global urban studies tend to first prescribe that new theorisation or concept work will inevitably reconstellate around the urban as a universal taken as given knowledge object. And secondly, I also want to query how the very notion of a more global urban studies unwittingly actually leaves untended the conceptualisation of the global or worldly in comparative thought, which is what I want to turn to now. So if part of my aim is to interrogate global claims or the worldly aspirations contained within Mustafa Saeed's Anglophonic Library, then it's worth ascertaining that as much as the world is a material, thingly, biophysical entity, one, one that we can see, right? It's also a figure, it's a concept that has deep historical roots in the European metaphysical tradition from Kant's engagement with the Copernican Revolution onwards. Sean Gaston's book, his 2013 book, The Concept of World from Kent, uh, from Kant to Derrida, is, I think, a wonderful exposition of this tradition. And what I want to emphasise is simply that it's this philosophical and hermeneutic tradition that tethers the concept of world and, by implication, the ever more worldly that decolonisation moves towards, to what Gaston refers to as the all-too-ready acceptance of a seemingly unavoidable logic of containment that has its roots in the classical tradition. Now, in a move that seems to build on this critique of, of, of containment, of this containment, Amir Mufti's most recent book, which is a critique of the, the category of world literature, has drawn our attention to the ways that the adjectival prefix of world in world literature functions as a plane of equivalence, a set of categorical grids and networks that seek, first of all, to render legible as literature a vast range of writing practices from across the world and across millennia, so as to be able, second, to make them available for comparison, classification and evaluation. Quoting Mufti there. So what he stresses is how the premise of a particular 
worldly or cosmopolitan imagination actually flattens difference, turning it into the comfortable coordinates of diversity because of the sticky particularity of that universal vision. Now, interrogating this problematic notion of global diversity is, of course, very relevant for thinking through a geography of difference in the comparative imagination. <clears throat> Indeed, this is the kind of algorithmic and computational geographical imagination that Gayatri Spivak critiques through her methodological trope of planetarity, which she proposes to overwrite the globe. So the globe and, and globalisation for Spivak imply the imposition of the same system of exchange everywhere. They're an extension of that containing sense of world in the classical tradition. The globe and globalisation um, for Spivak present us with an abstract ball covered in the lines of longitude, latitude and other computed lines of measurement and classification through which we can easily compare. So the globe is that which GIS and the graticule present to us for immediate comprehensibility. But Spivak's point is that immediate comprehensibility, uh, immediate comprehensibility is antithetical to actually existing singularity. And for Spivak, it's the, it's the planet that offers us a way around these reductive comparisons and into the ethical, ethico-conceptual space of singularity. The planet is that which slips from the grip of algorithmic or computational logic. It's that which can't be fixed by the messianic gaze of one system of measurement with universal pretensions. The planet, as she puts it, is in the species of alterity. It means such different things to different groups located discontinuously across its surface that it continually flings us away. Because alterity, as opposed to mere diversity, is underived from us. It's that for, we, for which we do not yet have the language. I think the key thing to draw out here is that if there will always be the kind of planetary difference that resists being known and therefore contained theoretically and conceptually, then planetary difference is a methodological challenge, actually. It's an, it's an imperative woven into decolonisation that should steer us toward the effort required to grasp differences on terms true to the singularity of those differences. So planetarity is thus a disposition to knowledge. And as Spivak writes, we must persistently educate ourselves into this particular mindset. Another point that I want to make with regards to planetarity is, is simply that it implicates geography as earth writing. Right? It asserts the always already multitudinous textualizations of multiple worlds. Educating ourselves into the mindset of planetarity, therefore, means developing literacies. Literacies that enable us to read the planet's many and discontinuous textual fabrics. In other words, and unsurprisingly given that Spivak and Mufti are literary theorists, the world or planet for them is textual. It's written. However, and this is a point I think that's sometimes been lost in, in recent debates, in my discipline at least... Um, that is, those concerning um, geography's materialist terms, the planet isn't always written in English. So what I'm concerned with is how to be able to read, to discern the outlines of the other story. How methodologically, as researchers, can we make that move into the text of the other? So in this sense, I think it's important to stress that the singularities I'm evoking in this paper are spatial and historical, not temporal as such. In other words, they're positioned in geographically relational ways to the cutting edge of, of social science knowledge production. Right? So uh, um, <coughs> the conferences in which we present our work, uh, our top peer-reviewed journals, seminar spaces um, like this, for example, so on and so forth. Now, these singularities... Uh, that I'm referring to are, 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 of course, historical insofar as they have their own relational histories, but they're simultaneous with us in the here and now. <clears throat> I 
And this is an important point to make because I want to be careful to position the kind of singularity that I'm mobilising in relation to Deleuzean patterns of repetition and difference, which produces um, a singularity that Deleuze opposes to representation, which is a move that I don't want to make. So when Deleuze writes of repetition as a singularity opposed to the general, and when he explicitly states that the theatre of repetition is opposed to the theatre of representation, just as movement is opposed to the concept and to representation, it's important to recognise the temporalising movement forward that he seems to be evoking. And furthermore, the, the aspatiality of that temporal movement. So Deleuzean singularity seems to me to be not the lateral movement into quite other spatial contexts where our literacy fails us. Deleuzean singularity isn't the movement out of the quite particular anglophonic epistemic space of Mustafa Said's library and into the Sudanese space that surrounds, so to speak. It's a temporalising movement forward that pushes beyond our extant representational capacity. My point, however, is that singularities are simultaneous with one another. They're relational too, but they're discontinuous with our conceptual systems. That's what makes them singular and incomparable in the concept worlds we inhabit. That said, I think Deleuze's central problematic regarding the essence of repetition is a useful one, insofar as, in his words, the problem is a question of knowing why repetition can't be explained by the form of identity in concepts or representations. And as Jenny Robinson has written in her far more astute reading of Deleuzean singularity than my own, she writes how Deleuzean singularity draws us into a proliferation of revisable ideas and infinite learning, already intimately connected with many other concepts and experiences, but amongst which there is no original model, original or copy. Now, for my purposes, this is incredibly useful, but only, I think, insofar as we can think that revisability across space, across space that's contiguous with us, but at the same time epistemically discontinuous. So it's the necessary temporal simultaneity and spatial contigu contiguity of this notion of the revisable idea that should prevent what, in research between global north and south, would, I think, be the, the easy option of reaching for the non-representational, where we simply do not yet understand. Now, to this extent, I think it's worth thinking with the imperative of decolonialism a little more concertedly. And I want to do this in relation to the uh, decolonial literature that's been em emerging out of Latin American studies over the last uh, couple of decades. So... The Modernity, Coloniality, Decoloniality, Decoloniality Research Pro Programme, emerging from scholars like <coughs> Anibal Quijano, Mario Lugones, Walter Mignola, and others, um, who point to the European conquest of Latin America as that which precipitated the constitution of a new world order that half a century later has resulted in a form of power covering more or less the whole globe, what they refer to, of course, as coloniality. So in this analysis, academic knowledge production, even in its critical leftist incarnations, results in what Mignolo refers to as a geopolitics of knowledge, wherein even critical leftist knowledge production is inseparable from the kind of coloniality that they diagnose. So in Mignolo's words, the planetary expansion of the social sciences implies that intellectual colonisation remains in place, even if such colonisation is well intended, comes from the left and supports uh, decolonisation. And what this puts to us is the very tricky double bind of paraphrasing Audre Lorde, dismantling the master's house with the master's tools. So what decolonial scholarship proposes then is a project of delinking knowledge production from the academy rather than the scholarly transformation within uh, sorry rather than scholarly transformation within the academy so it looks to indigenous southern thinkers for epistemic perspectives who heretofore obscured by the eurocentric rationality of Mustafa Said's library just as it urges us to interrogate 
the coloniality of the ways that terms like indigenous, southern, um, and subaltern, we might have to say, fix and contain those subjects and, and spatialities. So it suggests the very impossibility of decolonizing the academy from within, when the academy itself is the harbinger of, of coloniality. So in other words, for decolonialists, our attempts as academicians to decolonize social science knowledge are akin to tinkering while Rome burns. But as necessary as this position is, there are, I think, some serious problems with it. So first, as uh, Kieran Asher has pointed out, Mignolo and, and others um, seem to persistently fall into the trap of equating their political aims with theory. That is to say, a kind of theoretical orthodoxy has emerged around the modernity, decoloniality, coloniality programme, such that we end up with the intellectual object of so-called decolonial praxis as theory. In other words, the argument about delinking decolonial knowledge production from the academy can't itself be delinked from the academy, and thus has problems resisting the, the kind of commodification complicit with coloniality that they diagnose in the first place. Second, and, and moreover in my opinion, if the modernity, decoloniality, coloniality programs insistence on delinking is to be successful, we end, up in, um, we end up mitigating against the entry of subaltern, indigenous or southern thinkers into the formation of disciplinary thought or indeed public life. In fact, as the literary critic Jean Franco has observed, the eventual disintegration of the Latin, Latin American subaltern studies collective was in part due to that very tension between Latin American subalterns' potentially generative public role and disagreements about, uh, amongst the collective about that obstinate position of, of not representing the subaltern within the US Academy. So what this raises, I think, is the, is, is the problem not of displacing the Academy as such, but how to transform it. How to transform the shape of the knowledge produced within the Academy. How to bring the singularity of indigenous, southern or subaltern narratives into our imagination in ways that first pluralise the very we in here, and second, do so in order to reproduce the academy as a more open, heterogeneous, epistemic community, what Richard Nagar refers to as an anti-definitional analytical space. A space wherein those other voices aren't translated out of all recognition, such that they conform to our disciplinary, theoretical and conceptual protocols. And this, I think, is the challenge that singularity poses. And in the last half of the paper, what I want to um, do, I want to turn to singularity a little more directly, evoking a few methodological strategies and their potentials, if you like, that might routinely move us as researchers towards singularity and its potential. So I want to talk through five brief strategies, or tactics, if you will, for moving towards singularity that, that we might think about. And these aren't meant, meant as a kind of step-by-step -step guide in any sense. Um, rather, I guess in talking through them, I hope to be able to suggest something of what singularity itself offers in relation to the task of bringing difference and different kinds of knowledge into representation in the Anglophone social sciences. So they are, in turn, theory and reading friction and fragments, tra translatability and untranslatability, abiding by and poetic. So I'll talk through these. And I hope it's clear by now that the, the work I want the singular to do is ostensibly to pull us back from an intellectual culture of subsumption that reduces examples and cases to exchangeable instances or conceptual givens for the benefits of a disciplinary theory culture located here so to speak. Which brings me to my first point on theory and reading. <clears throat> the very question of theory, actually, in um, geography, but more, more generally in the social sciences, I would say, um, which have well debated the use and locatedness of theory 
Indeed, in my own field, it, feminist geographers in particular have, over the years, sought to interrogate the masculinity and hegemony of theory culture within the academy, which has precipitated an ongoing and healthy suspicion amongst geographers of what Saeed referred to as theory's bad infinity. At the same time, however, I think we can tend to take the theoretical for granted. And what I want to stress is that certainly in, in geography, we rarely stop to consider what exactly constitutes a theoretical text. In other words, to what do we refer when we talk about theory? What is it that distinguishes theory from data or narrative? In fact, I think our un unthinking tendency to separate and intuitively know theory from method is something that I think we've inherited from the positivist scientific method. Sorry. Um, now, the Brazilian philosopher Marilena Chaui regards this unthinking approach to theoretical knowledge objects as a form of authoritarian thought, which she says frees itself from the disturbing need to confront that which has not, been, uh, not yet been thought. Now, this kind of authoritarian thought, she stresses, is incapable of thinking difference. And my point here is not an anti-theoretical one, but I do want to suggest that we might retreat a little bit, a little bit from simple bifurcations of the theoretical from the empirical, from truth claims made in the absence of particular fields and contexts. The more important question when we're building more global theoretical repertoires is what exactly is theory for? Of what use is it? And how can it be mobilised for politico-intellectual ends? Not how can we theorise better, but why theorise better? The, the so what of theory, as it were. And insofar as I think these are important, I think these, these questions are important, I think these are questions that need to be directed to problem spaces located in our field context. So in this, in this respect, singularities demand a relatively undisciplined kind of disciplinary knowledge production. Not in the sense of unrigorous work per se, but in the sense of a careful and active work that, quoting Richard Nagar again, places question marks on the utility and logic of neat positions and categories, given that those very positions and categories reflect the epistemic hierarchies, the logic and investments of our own locations as Euro-American geographers or, or social scientists. So singularities demand to be read in their specificity, and that requires attention to historical difference. The imperative here is to think what we can learn from literary, testimonial, or ethnographic narratives in and of themselves, and how that learning may, in fact, precipitate a useful kind of unlearning, actually, an unlearning of the theoretical orthodoxies with which we're familiar and through which we transact in the academy. And I use that word transact deliberately because I think it signifies nicely the accrual of value that accompanies correct theoretical practice or innovative theoretical practice. So further, how might we contextualise those narratives historically, socially and culturally such that we can read from them what Raymond Williams referred to as the structures of feeling to which they point. And this, I think, is the work of close reading that's both radically empirical in its attention to particular and singular narratives, but at once also theoretical insofar as it enables a kind of correct and contextualised vision. So, for example, in my own work on um, Buddhism and the aesthetic production of ethnicising space and political geography in Sri Lanka... This has entailed a, 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 a conscious decision, if you like, to stand at something of a remove from the literature in my field, in my discipline, on the geographies of religion and post- or infrasecularism, which I would argue ends up holding the Enlightenment concept of religion and the sacred-secular binary woven into it intact. And in the Sri Lankan context, um, notwithstanding the colonial history of world religion scholarship and a late 19th century history of Protestant Buddhism that produced and institution institutionalised the presence of Buddhism and its ethnicising Sinhala power today, fragments from my fieldwork revealed how Buddhist metaphysics also exist aesthetically in ways that aren't reducible to the concept of religion. 
That is to say, Buddhism exists as an environmental structure of feeling, consolidated in and through certain kinds of spatialities, and told to me in terms, idioms and allegories, incomparable with categorical understandings of religion, of the sacred secular binary, around which our disciplinary debates um, in, in, in geography um, tend to circulate. What that briefest of examples um, reveals, I hope, is not that it's not singularities that exist in some kind of pristine yet impossible vacuum. I don't want to essentialise the singular. Instead, I, I guess what I want to point to is what Anna Singh refers to as the grip of global encounter or friction, which for Singh is the traction of universals as they're lived. So in my context, it's been useful to think about how Buddhism thought as an institutional presence, a discourse, and colonially contrived world religion, in other words, a category, how it's negated as it's lived from its inside out, aesthetically, intuitively, by people who would at the same time claim to be secular and thus modern. So looking for those um, points of friction entails, in Singh's words, turning away from formal abstractions to see how universals are used. She points, for example, to Celia Lowe's work on the species collection activities of a conservation organisation in um, the Indonesian Togian Islands, where she found that English-speaking volunteers refused to learn the Indonesian names for the species that they found. So they believed their task uh, to instead be one of directly matching organisms found with their with their internationally recorded Latin species names. And their Indonesian hosts tended to juggle local, national and Latin species names. But in their reports, only the Latin names tended to count. It was only the Latin names that had value. And what Singh is interested here, in here is this moment of friction where biological material, biological material is purified of its own spatial contextual and singular histories. So friction allows her a way into following the articulative process, dipping into the cultural resources and clues she finds and tracing their meanings closer to the ground than to their global resonances. So to this extent, <clears throat> Singh's friction reveals itself in what I think we can refer to as fragments empirical shards that reveal themselves in fields and archives, <clears throat> excuse me, be they material or textual. And the fragment is a just as useful trope to think with, I think, in the context of singularity. And I've been influenced here by uh, some of Colin McFarlane's recent work in which he's been trying to think about what fragments reveal about urbanism. And in doing so, he, he methodologically mobilises a longer history of subaltern studies writings on the fragment that I think are really useful with respect to singularity. So fragments, he reminds us, have been fundamental to the Subaltern Studies projects because they present tantalising clues to other histories and to new forms of conceptualisation and methodology, often hinted at in archival research, but speaking to a different way of conceiving some of the basic categories of historical investigation. I mean, so far as fragments attest to empirical variation, they evidence new vantage points. And in our own work as social scientists, uh, we might think about fragments as those traces found in, in field or archival work, a, a scrap of speech, a tract of text, a narrative, a material thing found or alluded to by a, a research participant, perhaps. So fragments don't quite make sense to our well-trained ethnographic eyes or historical gazes. Fragment is thus an evidence of some other whole thing, but evidence of what we're not yet quite sure. And drawing on Dipesh Chakrabarti, the fragment, um, McFarlane writes, is a provocation that demands recognition that the world is so plural as to be impossible of description in any one system of representation. So the fragment in this analysis is a lure, an invitation to pause and stay with difference, or as McFarlane has put it elsewhere, drawing on the anthropologist Brian, Brian Larkin's work, it leads us towards a language to be learned.
So if the fragment leads us towards a, a language to be learned, it necessitates translational work. And there's a lot to say, of course, about translation and decolonization, but what, what I want to touch on here is how singularity might usher us into linguistic and ethnographic spaces of translation, and importantly also spaces of untranslatability. So for Walter Benjamin, the task of the translator is always to find an echo of the original in the language into which something is being translated. But for Benjamin, the implication of this is that technically passable, even technically perfect, linguistic translation is never enough. It's the incomprehensible, the secret, the poetic that good translation must veer towards. In this respect, I think it can be useful to think of ethnographic and historical work as itself an act, an act of translation, insofar as it always involves learning the poetics of another form of life. And as much as, I guess as much as I'd want to hold on to this, it's important to remember that translation is also about the hard work of language. It's about textuality. It's about idiom. Translation is what Spivak refers to as the most intimate act of reading, a literal act of, of surrendering to the text of the other. <clears throat> now, I mentioned Spivak because she's not just a literary critic, of course, but a translator. It's one most famously of perhaps of Derrida's of grammatology, but she's also translated um, the Indian Bengali fiction writer Mahaswata, Mahaswata Devi, whose fiction helped to bring the exploitation and neglect of Indian tribals, or its Adivasi communities, into representation. And though Devi published over 100 novels and 20 collections of, of, of uh, short stories in Bengali, her, her renown in the English-speaking world has arguably been very much due to Spivak's translation of three of her books um, in, in the one publication. And it's Davy's story, Pterodactyl, Puran Sahe and Pirtha, in the, 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 that book, Imaginary Maps, that I want to focus on here. Uh, and my, the main protagonist in that story is, is um, I'm sure many people in this room might have um, come across it already, but the main protagonist is a journalist and caste Hindu, Puran Sahe, who travels to the fictional Pirtha block in Madhya Pradesh, um, home to an Adivasi community of some 80,000 people whose land has been destroyed, uh, devastated by the fallout from the Bhopal gas disaster in the mid-1980s. Now on the map, Pirtha block is shaped like some extinct forgotten animal, the pterodactyl, no less. And the community are suffering drought compounded by a, a contaminated water table, coupled with neglect as well as ill-informed and piecemeal development initiatives that prove no practical use in the face of their hunger and the local epidemic of enteric fever that's decimating the community. In Pirtha Block, Puran Sahe's guide is an old friend, a block development officer called Harish Haran, who introduces him to representatives from the tribal community, including a man called Shankar and a boy called Bikya. And Bikya communicates with a pterodactyl-like creature that in the story embodies the soul of the community's ancestors, which has come back to mourn the destruction and disfiguration of their land and indeed of the tribal community. Now, I'll come back to the poetics of the pterodactyl in a short while, but for now I want to dwell on one passage in the story where Shankar, the tribal representative, is explaining to Puran Sahih and Harishar the plight of his community. <clears throat> he says... Uh, sorry, Davy says, that Shankar goes on talking with his eyes closed. Alas, he speaks Hindi. Puran and Harisharan also speak Hindi, but how can one touch the other? Shankar says his say in Hindi, but the experience is a million mo moons old, when they didn't speak Hindi. Puran thinks he doesn't know what language Shankar's people spoke, what they speak. There are no words in their language to explain the daily experience of the tribal in today's India. Pashupati Jonko of the Ho tribe in Singbum, a native Ho speaker, had said with humble amazement at the time of translating Bursamunda's life into the Ho language, 
There are no words for exploitation or deprivation in the whole language. There was an explosion in Purin's head that day. So Bursamunda was a freedom fighter and tribal uh, folk hero in the, 19th, in the late 19th century. Now, as a story and documentarian of Adivasi experience, what are clearly important to Davy are moments of untranslatability. So it's not just that this short passage reveals exploitation and deprivation to be not endemic to tribal society in those terms. It's also that Shankar's narrative, his testimonial, is incomprehensible to Puran and Harisharan, even as Shankar speaks in, in Hindi, which is Pur Puran and Harisharan's language, because there are no words in their language, Hindi, to explain the daily experience of the tribal in today's India. In other words, in Hindi, the ordinary contours of tribal life are unfathomable. Yet for Puran, it's precisely in that unfathomability, in his inability to grasp the tribal experience, that he sees something of the difference, that he feels something of the difference. It's in that fragment, in other words, it's in that fragment of uncommunication that an experience is actually communicated. Later in the story, the pterodactyl comes to stand for this difference, for the poetics of this incommunicable experience. As Puran says to his friend, Harisharan, the block development officer, after himself having come face to face with the pterodactyl, there's no communication point between us and the pterodactyl. We belong to two worlds and there's no communication point. There was a message in the pterodactyl, whether it was fact or not, and we couldn't grasp it, we missed it. We suffered a great loss, yet we couldn't know it. So Davy shows, I think, how moments of untranslatability can, in fact, be immensely productive encounters where incommensurable differences encounter one another. And the literary theorist Emily Apter has recently pointed to the political potential of, as she writes, activating untranslatability as a theoretical fulcrum for work across the social sciences and humanities that can ethically and practically stand in opposition to what she refers to as the gargantuan scale of the anglophonic globalisation of, of, of social sciences knowledge production. Singularities, I would suggest, can reveal themselves in moments of translation failure that we need to hold on to, as, as Davy skillfully does. And Spivak's, I would also add that Spivak's translation of pterodactyl does this, because it retains in italicised text all words that appear in English in the original text. So in other words, all those words that um, Davy can't translate, it, can't translate from English to Bengali are retained as material traces of colonialism. There's also um, a brief postscript to Pterodactyl in which Davy writes, I'd merely tried to express my estimation born of experience of Indian tribal society through the myth of the Pterodactyl. And what I want to tease out from this briefest of statements is simply the time, the effort, the patience that Davy spent on the tribal issue through her literary career. A singularity, I think, demands this kind of sticking with, of attending to, and thus making oneself part of a particular problem space located in one's field. So this is about cultivating an orientation and responsibility to the demands of a field site or area studies community, and also of treating that space as a fully formed intellectual community, not simply a data reservoir. And in his work um, on Sri Lankan literary fiction and civil conflict, the literary critic Kadri Ismail refers to this pro as a process of abiding by, abiding by the places on which we work, which entails the injunction to, quoting him, to wait, stay, pause, delay, tarry over, remain after others have gone, Continue, sojourn, dwell, stand firm by, hold to, remain true to, endure, encounter, withstand or sustain, and finally, to suffer even. Now my point here is, is not that as researchers we don't already try our hardest to do this, but it's to query the, the, how compatible that kind of patient attention to the singular is, uh, where not much may change over long stretches of time. How compatible that is with the temporality and scale of large grant-funded research projects that promotion and reputation are increasingly dependent upon in the corporate university today. <coughs> I also wonder how comparative research might negotiate this kind of dilemma. 
My final um, point is in fact something that I guess I've been gesturing towards throughout this paper, uh, and that is poetics really as a vehicle for moving us toward the singular, towards the unverifiable, the statistically insignificant. I've already indicated how Walter Benjamin emphasised that the task of the translator is to move readers to what he refers to as the poetic. And it's in this notion of the poetic image that the singular, I think, reveals itself as something. But of course, the thing about poetry is that the, so the social sciences too often pathologises it. Literally, if we take pathologise to mean treating something as abnormal. abnormal. So the poetic is, is in many senses the opposite of the statistical, um, sorry, of the statistical, the conceptual, or indeed the, the democratic majority. In other words, poetics comprise the manifold narratives of the minority, the otherwise excluded or the forgotten, which are precisely what I want to activate, activate by inviting the singular into our disciplinary domain, but also precisely what the social sciences um, so often legislates against in its enumerative mode. Throughout the paper, I've drawn extensively on literature and literary theory for some good reasons. I think literature tells stories. And I think we need to remember that part of our tasks, um, as geographers certainly, is to listen effectively to stories. Um, not just to listen, actually, but to learn how to read stories. And to be, and, and to be sure, our task is also to tell the stories that our work yields in non-reductive ways. As Richard Nagar has written, stories are a medium through which fragmented truth claims emerge, get interwoven and reworked to eventually lead us to forms of epistemic wholeness. In this sense, and following Edouard Glissant in his um, book, The Poetics of Relation, poetic thought safeguards the particular. It affords us the power to experience the shock of the elsewhere. And I think this kind of cerebral electric shock is exactly what decoloniality requires. For Audre Lorde, uh, another writer I mentioned earlier, who celebrates the potential of the poetic image in intellectual work, poetry is the way we help give name um, to the nameless so it can be thought. So my point in relation <clears throat> to the literary is that the, it's the poetic image, the figure that the singular offers us before any theoretical disfiguration the pterodactyl in Mahasweta uh, Devi's um, pterodactyl Puran Sahay and Pitta is exactly such a figure. It's the ungraspable other, the nameless, that emerges into thought from Devi's poetic image. As Spivak writes in her afterword to the collection, for the modern Indian, the pterodactyl is an empirical impossibility. For the modern tribal Indian, the pterodactyl is the soul of the ancestors. The fiction doesn't judge between the registers of truth and exactitude. It simply stages them in separate spaces. This is not science fiction, and the pterodactyl is not a symbol. So what I think as I read pterodactyl Purun Sahe and Pitta is that there's probably no better text with which to teach underdevelopment and tribal issues in northern India. In its very singularity, the text may, can become a valuable theoretical resource. Okay, um, so the paper has been um, a beginning of a manifesto for sorts. There are no doubt more, many more methodological strategies that one might want to discuss in the service of singularity, but I hope that by discussing just a few, I've demonstrated something of the potential for the task of, um, something of its potential for the task of intellectual and disciplinary decolonization in, in a social science context. I don't really have a conclusion to the paper, but rather something like a last point to make. And that is that singularity is in many ways opposed to the corporate university and para-university context today. It's opposed to the, the gargantuan scale and global ambition of many of our institutions. Thus, it is difficult. In this sense, I think it, it necessitates what Stefano Harney and Fred Moten referred to as a fugitive relationship to the university. It might even necessitate what they refer to as a certain kind of abuse of the university's hospitality, as a way of bringing an uncanny, meaning an unhomely quality to the university, of defamiliarising it. 
And if our university institutions are indeed serious about decolonisation, I think they'll tolerate this kind of fugitivity and embrace the imminent prospect of their own defamiliarisation. But it's important also that we persist in our fugitivity as well. Thanks. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk, Terry. So I'll hand over to you, Raoul, for some comments. That would be fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for writing this beautiful paper. This is not a word I use for academic papers often, so I, I really encourage you to, to actually read the text of the paper. Um, it's, um, I, I have three questions, and I'm just going to ask them one after the other in, in the interest of getting the discussion going. Um, the word manifesto is an interesting one to use for this paper because manifestos usually conjure up this image of a list of things to be done, a program, a path to move forward. And what this really is, is I, I read this paper as a kind of uh, portfolio of sensibilities, uh, an inventory of orientations, of ways to be towards the world. Um, if you were interested in the project of decolonizing knowledge production, so it's not so much a toolkit as as um, as, a, as a set of orientations um, um, and sensibilities. Um, when I'm giving advice to graduate students, I often struggle with what form that should take. So while I share almost in, in its entirety the aspiration towards this kind of sensibility. Um, I think there's always the struggle of, uh, let me put it quite bluntly, the graduate student who follows the advice in this paper will have great difficulty in finding a job. <laughs> think about what you say under the heading abiding. Take your time over projects. Um, this is really very difficult to do. Um, it's much easier for those of us with some degree of security to, to advocate these kinds of orientations. But I find it quite difficult to do it with a straight face when I'm confronting a, a PhD student or somebody who hasn't yet got that security. I want to make a world in which it is possible to give this kind of advice, but in the interim, before we get there, it feels quite difficult to have this kind of conversation. So I'd be interested in um, how you think about that. And my last question also sort of relates to that. My second question is about singularity. Um, which is in some ways the most interesting word in the whole paper and it's one you keep re returning to. Um, and, and I'd like to probe a little bit what singularity means and what it commits us to. Um, in particular, I'm, I'm wondering why we must think of alterity or why we must orient ourselves towards alterity as singularity when very often things that look singular to us uh, may conceive of themselves as universals. And this is not which, that is to say, I think, to insist on calling the other singular runs the risk of provincializing the already provincialized and perhaps denying its aspiration to, to a universality. No doubt some alterities do want to remain minor. And, and explicitly do not want to become major because they know what it is to be major. They've been at the receiving end of it and do not wish to, to, to perpetrate it or perpetuate it. But, also, but on the other hand, I think a lot of things that might look singular to us do have an aspiration to universality so that what we might be confronting is not a distinction between a universal and a particular, but a distinction between a triumphant universal and a defeated universal. Um, and I'd be interested in whether and how that might enter into this sensibility that, that you're urging us to, to think about. Um, I also think that, so related to that point, the whole orientation of the paper is making singulars intelligible to us, where this us is a sort of imperial center that you call <coughs> disciplinary geography. So I understand that that's that's what you're trying to do in the paper, and I think that's an entirely legitimate objective. But I think if that's the only question on the table, then we might be missing the ways in which singulars are actually 
um, relatable to, commensurable with, translatable to other singulars. Which is to say that wh where, while ho may not be translatable into Hindi, it might be much more easily translatable into Naga or Mizo or Santali or some, some other language that comes out of a life world that has had similar experiences and can therefore understand the kinds of concepts that are being gestured towards. One book that's made me think about this is um, Robbie Shilliam's Black Pacific, which is the story of the encounter between um, Rastafari and Maori. It's a complicated story of how that encounter happens in New Zealand. But one of the things that becomes evident in that story is that uh, the, when these singularities encounter each other, they actually do find a language in which to articulate what is a universal experience for them. So, Pakia supremacy and Babylon, which is the opponent in their respective worldviews, uh, become equated to one another uh, in a way that becomes possible because both have been at the receiving end of white supremacy. So, all of that to speak to the question of singularity and how singularities might actually be universals that we just don't get. But to insist on seeing them as singulars, I think, continues to possibly miss that. And the final question is about fugitivity, which you hinted at at the end. And this is really interesting, particularly for us at Soros. So I just, I'm going to very quickly read out two sentences from the end of the paper, where you say, uh, referencing Harney and Morton, and the advocacy of fugitivity in relation to the university, um, they advocate a fugitive relationship to the university. It might even necessitate what they refer to as a certain kind of abuse of the university's hospitality as a way of bringing an uncanny quality to the university or defamiliarizing it. And then you say, if our university institutions are indeed serious about decolonization, they will tolerate this fugitivity and embrace the imminent prospect of their own defamiliarization. In some ways, this is happening at SOAT. The administration has embraced the decolonization agenda, made it its own, championed it, tried to think about ways in which to mainstream it. And this has led to a suspicion among some of us that uh, we might be co-opted in this moment. But it's very difficult to know whether we are being co-opted or whether an argument has been won. Mm. And I'm curious about that distinction and how one knows which side of that line one is on. Um, and I think you're, you're very attentive to that because you talk about persisting in our fugitivity even if that's happened. But what is that saying? Are you saying that the, the frontier must constantly be pushed no matter where it falls? Or are you saying that we should always be suspicious even of success, especially of success in, in this context? Fantastic thought-provoking questions there. So I'll give you a chance to respond and then we can uh, open up to the floor for a broader discussion. Yeah, um, well, thank you. Is this, do I need to turn this on? Or is it... um, should be all right now. Okay, um, fantastic, thank you. Well, I'm not going to do, certainly not going to do justice to those fantastically um, provocative and productive comments and questions. I guess one of the things that might be useful to say, and I should have said this when I started really, is that um, this paper was written for a geography conference originally. It's written for the RGS IBG conference at uh, the Royal Geographical Society that is, um, in, with the Institute of British Geographers Conference um, in late 2017, the theme of which was decolonizing geographical knowledge. So there was a particular kind of and quite specific provocation to which it was responding. Um, and, and it was responding to that provocation really by way of taking on a quite particular um, I'm not going to say orthodoxy, but a set of writings that had emerged in the discipline, that have emerged in the discipline, which I mentioned, which is the kind of comparative urban scholarship or the urban comparativism scholarship, which has emerged and, and, and gained a lot of traction. Um, and it always, I think it sort of left me feeling a little bit... Um, I've written elsewhere about this, but it always, it, it, it all, that much as I take from that work, it always leaves me a little bit dissatisfied insofar as I find the urban studies 
an urban geography um, community to not want to go that one step further and undo what that particular concept of the city or the urban or urbanisation. And that's, you know, it's something of where to contextualise this paper, I guess. Um, I mean, yeah, the, the, I'm trying to think about where to start, actually. The, your first and your last points about fugitivity, what that, what that looks like, right, and how one can, how one can actually actualise that in the context of a, of, a, of a university context that demands so much from us still and still continues to kind of um, take from us in, in many ways. That, I'm glad you you know the, the, you pointed out the last line. Sorry, I've gone back to the title slide now. By that last line, which is we must persist in our fugitivity, because I think that's really important. But you're absolutely right to point out that you know to what extent to when do we say well that battle's been won, or whatever. But I I think that you know maybe I don't really have any answers in a in a um, you know in I don't think there really are any answers in the in the register of the general to that question because I think these are about political battles, right? They're about knowing what political battles one needs to fight in one's institution or within the the context of the the university as a whole. And a lot of this, uh, the stuff that we're, we're we're pushing back against as academics is um, is 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 so embedded, right, that it becomes difficult to think about how conditions can change. I've been thinking about this a lot um, recently in the context of my own editorial work, as, um, as you mentioned, I edit um, a journal called Antipode, which um, is a journal, a radical journal of geography, right, that was still published by a commercial academic publisher whose, whose bottom line is financial <laughs> bottom line, right? So that's, you know, how does one negotiate radicality, or in inverted commas, with, with, with market? Right? And these are, these are very kind of pressing questions. How does one negotiate then um, um, how does one negotiate how that impinges upon one's editorial sensibilities? You know, how one reads, actually. And that's a real question that I, I, I ask myself, because I think a lot of what I'm talking about is a, is a reflection on a particular kind of governmentalization of us. Right, and the way that we as academics go about our jobs um, and the relationship between the politics of what we do um, and the, the kind of passion as well, the way that we de derive a certain kind of um, enjoyment actually, you know, a kind of fulfilment in the work we do and that we progress in terms of, you know, taking that step from graduate student to first academic post or getting promoted within the academy, etc. Um, I don't know... that I, I necessarily share all of your pessimism. I think that, you know, certainly on kind of um, uh, panel selection, uh, interview panels I've been on um, in the past, that, you know, one of the things that, without exception, actually, that, that, we, that we've been looking for in those panel, panels are, are the intellectual trajectories of scholars, right? Uh, what questions people are working on the so what of those questions. So I do, I do think, you know, there, there are then, then of course you get, you know, all the other things that, that kick in about kind of referability and, and um, is this person likely to pull in grant income and all those kinds of horrible sort of considerations. But I do think that at the same time, you know, most of the people that I've kind of communicated with about those kinds of decisions, um, um, want to know about a person's intellectual and political trajectory, you know, how what they're working on matters and where it takes the, a department or, or a collective in terms of what they do. So I think there are, there are kind of, you know, seeds of hope in that respect, but I absolutely understand that, you know, and I, I feel that as well, that kind of advising of graduate students about the necessity of, of, of doing this, that and the other, playing the game, etc. So I don't, you know, that's a, that's a kind of fluff, really, in terms of an answer to, 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 to that question. Um, your second point around um, what singularity means and what it commits us to, I, I, 
think you're absolutely right. And one of the things that it probably should commit us to is solidarities, actually. Um, and, and that maybe connects your, your second and your, your third question, actually. But I think this sort of sense of um, clearing space, giving, giving, not giving, but working hard to, to create space for communities of practice, communities of thought, communities to bring themselves into representation on their own terms is also about the potential for making, building solidarities. And I think that's a, a really important thing to emphasise. So I don't want to, you know, this is not the work of this paper, the orientation that I'm, I'm suggesting through the course of this paper is not a, um, is not about um, preserving, essentializing the singular. It, it is about building solidarities, I would say, actually. Um, I, I was at a conference in the weekend, at the weekend where um, the relationships between testimony and environment were, were, were on the table for discussion. And I think testimony is, is, is a really, maybe a really important kind of word to mention in this context, right? So that there is a sort of, in some senses, this paper is about the politics of representation. It's about a kind of um, set of orientations that might clear space for difference within the academy. Um, there's a lot more that you mentioned, which I kind of will, will, will no doubt sort of think about at three in the morning. And go, oh, I wish I'd said yeah, that or something. But I mean, that's the point of responding: is that you give me such a lot to think about. I think maybe you can. Right. Yeah, why don't we open it up to the floor then? Who would like to ask a question? Have we got some mics that might be floating around to aid you with your audibility? Uh, do you want to... Um, go? Yeah. Hello. Um, thank you very much for that talk. Um, I found it particularly exciting as someone who is actually located in the geography department um, over at Birkbeck. And um, I think, you know, the kinds of discussions which are going on very belatedly around decolonizing geography are absolutely essential and, and um, you know, need to draw on the kinds of things you've raised. Um, I was very struck when you um, uh, started with that metaphor from um, Seasons of Migration, which I must admit I haven't read, so I'm going by your, your account of it, but I was very uh, struck by the fact that the room, the library, was a, a closed, sealed, secret mm. room. And then um, you, you said that then there was the rest of Sudan, and um, in, in contrast to that, in a way, the outside. Um, and I mean, I wondered how we then address the whole questions of, of the porousness, in fact, of, mm. of those, those boundaries. And, I suppose that sort of led me on to the question which I'm sure you've, you've thought about because it's not in any way a new question, which is how then um, when we use notions like singularity, we avoid and, and we recommend our, our research students and so on to adopt them, how we then avoid the whole, it becoming a kind of a search for authenticity and the kind of untainted. Uh, which of course then reinscribes power in, in, in the centers of academia mm. and so on. Um, and the other thing I was wondering about really was how within this framework we address what happens when, when subaltern and oppressed groups in fact um, embrace and kind of reorient certain ideas around modernity. And I'm thinking for example of Dalit groups in India at the moment and, and um, Ambedkar, I thinking, and so on, which is very much counterposed to the kind of, uh, you know, the Hindu right and their kind of ideas about uh, about all of this. So, so, and even in fact, when we think of of the left, because we, you know, we tend to think of the left as something, uh, you know, located at the global north. But in in, for example, where I work in Bihar, it's the left is so very embedded in in the local and in those particular spaces that, you know, telling those, those activists in those places that they're in fact, um, you know, using Western discourses and so on is, is, is clearly 
a, a, a pitfall. Mm -hmm. and I, but I'm sure it's something you've thought about, so I just wanted to, mm -hmm. to get your thoughts on that. Okay, great. We've got another question just behind you and then one at the front. Um, thank you um, for your talk. It was really interesting and thank you for your um, responses, Raoul. Um, I was actually wanted to pick up just quickly on something you said about the decolonizing process in SOAS, actually. And I'm definitely from my perspective and a lot of some people in uh, groups like Decolonizing Our Minds, there would be sort of no hesitation to say that it's been very superficially uh, co-opted by the institution in a way that we have very much reorients um, decol decolonization, decolonial theory around knowledge production and detaches it from the material inequalities and conditions that exist within the university. Um, so I thought maybe if you could pick up on some of um, those issues of like the material implications of decoloniality and how singularity plays into that. And the other thing that I kind of would um, like to hear a bit more from just to clarify the concept in my own mind is that when I've been trying to engage in some decolonial theory. I've come across um, pluriversality and plurality um, in quite a lot of people's works. And I was wondering what, how singularity di yeah, is in dialogue with, the, with those concepts as well. Great, and one more here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for, for the talk and just um, I've tried to put down a question, but I guess I have, I'm still like in the process of, of like taking in s s some of the concepts. Um, someone that perhaps engage with a geography that instead is materialist and might reproduce some of, of, of uh, the, the sort of uh, um, narratives uh, that indeed we need to challenge. I wonder though how through the concept of singularity we can capture issues of injustice and inequality. Because when we talk about geographies of difference, that tells only part of the story if we don't put power in the context, right? These are geographies of, of inequality, these are geographies of oppression. So I wonder how does the notion that you use actually speak to uh, these concepts that re-embed power in, 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 in uh, um, in, in uh, you know, the type of sort of uh, uh, tropes, but also in the maps we aim uh, to draw across the world economy. I guess it speaks a little bit about uh, Raoul's second question. So I understand you saying that uh, it's uh, a matter of creating space, but it's not just about representation, is it? It's also about fighting oppression. So how do we actually do that in practice to the concept you're proposing? Thanks. Give you a few minutes to respond to those. Then we can see about sure. Yeah. Um, and not sure I can adequately <laughs> respond to the excellent questions. Um, but maybe that last question connects a bit to the to the first part of the first question. Insofar as um, um, I, there's a question, I guess, uh, that arises with this notion of this, this the singular or singularity around essentialism. Um, and you know, there's, it's certainly not my intention. As I mentioned in response to um, Raoul's qu uh, questions, it's certainly not my intention to suggest that the you know the, the singular should exist as a singular in some kind of pristine vacuum or something like that. Right? Um, I, I want to pose it as a methodological disposition. I think one of the words that you, the phrases that you use, Raoul, is there's a sort of or the paper's about an or cultivating an orientation, and I, I think that's kind of what I would what I would. So that's a great way of um, putting it, I think. It's certainly what I think, it's, an, it's a really good description for this paper, perhaps a better one than I could have come up with. So I, I would like to see this as a way of cultivating perhaps an orientation, not about somehow, you know, um, um, trying to grab hold of or, or claim to authentically be able to represent singular narratives, right? But it's about, I do think it is about clearing the space for um, people to feel able to represent themselves on their own terms, on terms true to the singularity of those differences. It's one of the phrases used in the paper. Um, absolutely, one must, you know, part of what we do in the academy um, must be about um, speaking truth to power, right? So it must be about confronting injustice, and, and, and absolutely. So I think, you know, there's a kind of, 
there's an old debate here about um, where, where a deconstructive or a post-structural mode of analysis um, opens the door to a certain kind of relativism, right? And I don't want to sort of fall into that. So I think that kind of um, solidarity building is really important in this work. Again, as I, I mentioned in response to Raoul, so you know, if we're able to listen, if we're able to um, um, to, to to provide a space where narratives can emerge in ways that aren't that aren't disfigured by um, the hegemony of a theory culture that is part of the material conditions of the existence of the university coming to the second question, right? Then maybe we have the chance to, to build um, solidarities. Um, so I would say that political strategy is, is hugely important. I mean, post-colonial theory for me has always been about intervening, about providing ways of intervening. So I, I think that's a hugely important part of um, of thinking about what it is that we do as academics. Um, so I guess that would be something like a kind of an answer to the first part of the first question and the last question um, as well. Um, the, the, the first question also made me think about, you know, when I think I've thought about this a lot when you refer to the relationship between the closed library and um, su the Sudanese space that surrounds. You know, one of the Fixes that geography has, the, one of the fixes that geography has, and other social sciences has um, sought to kind of remedy that for the last 200 years or so is field work. Right? Um, so that, I thought about that a lot after um, writing this paper. Actually, that you know, don't geographers always just you know say that that's what we do anyway? We go out into the field, anthropologists as well, and you know. Um, any number of others, right? We go out into the field and, and use that knowledge in the field to update what's in the library. You know, the, 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 the library motif is a motif. It's imperfect in many ways, but I think it kind of provides a nice way into that um, relationship between theory and narrative, really, or theory and data, which is a really complicated relationship. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily claim to have nailed that at all. <laughs> um, I think it, it's something that really kind of necessitates um, that we think hard about it, that we think hard about, you know, what, what is it that we think we're mobilising when we talk about theory, right? What, what is it that distinguishes a theoretical text from um, uh, an empirical text? Um, and I think, you know, when we teach as well, Certainly in, in, in geography, you know, we tend to replicate, replicate that kind of intuitive distinction by teaching, for example, theoretical issues in the discipline and then data collection, right? As if, as if the two don't sort of, um, well, as if, as if the two can easily be separated like that. And that's always really puzzled me, actually. So I think, you know, a lot of this is about sort of the orientation that the paper is cultivating is turning those kinds of critical lenses back onto ourselves and that maybe is a way of segueing into the um, second question uh, which is this is all part of the material um, conditions of the production of knowledge in the university right? and the para-university context. Again, I think Raoul's uh, comments hinted um, or pushed towards this. Um, it's bigger than the university itself. It's the market for the, the, the kinds of knowledge that are produced in the university. It's impact. Why is teaching not impact, right? Uh, one of the, surely one of the most impactful things that I can hope to do as an academic is teach, uh, uh, encouraging students to maybe think critically or think differently, right? Um, um, the, 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 the mechanisms, the tools with which we measure impact, for example, so I think it's all of these questions, and I, again, I don't... The danger, I guess, with writing one of these kinds of papers is I think you're right to say it's about cultivating orientations. It's really not about solving anything. So, um, yeah. Great. Are there any more questions um, that anybody had? Because if not, we've got a 
drinks reception that's about to start in the senior common room, so we could go and continue the discussion there. But I just want to see if there's any more, any more burning questions. Yeah, we've got one at the back. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> the plural reversal. Um, I, I, I would have to say that that I mean my knowledge of of the um, of that literature, Escobar and so forth, is um, is not what it should be. But I think that I mean the idea of the of the plural reversal seems to me to be hinged around this notion that there are many um, there are many different universals, right? So it's the point you raised, actually. Um, and yeah, absolutely. I mean, we... Absolutely. Um, and it's a really... It's, thank you for reminding me, because it's, really, it's a really important point, because it also encourages us to provincialise ourselves, right? It also reminds us to provincialise... Um, the decolonial or the post-colonial as a perspective, as one approach, as one strategy, as one methodology. I think it's really important to remember, I, I tend to I go back to, to Gayatri Spivak's writings quite a lot, and it's, you know, it's really important to, for me at least to remember that one of the, one of, I guess, her most important books was, which is sort of um, um, often thought about as a, you know, one of the sort of handbooks of post-colonial studies is, is is titled a critique of postcolonial reason, right? So in a, it's an attempt at erasure. It's an attempt at it's an attempt at least at, at kind of um, provincialising the professionalisation of a particular disciplinary formation. Um, and I think that is a kind of ongoing task, right? I think you know knowledge production is like a um, a conversation for me in the sense that, and a conversation is always involves three processes, right? It's, it's um, speaking, listening, but also being moved. So it's, you know, it's iterative. It, it, it always seeks out new positions. Um, so, yeah. I guess, can I, I just, um, I, I think um, some of those, that, those questions about the material circumstances and of the university might have been also directed to Raoul's comments as well. So I don't know if you, you probably have far more no, coherent things to say about it than me. A drink is necessary. Okay, excellent. Well, please join me in thanking both our speaker and discussant this evening.